Tonight we'll continue in the 26th chapter of Genesis, where we begin the 26th chapter of Genesis. This will be our 41st lesson in this, uh, this book. Isaac and the famine in Canaan. <clears throat> we'll be looking over the first 23 verses. And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She's my sister. For he feared to say, She's my wife, lest, said he, the men of this place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech king of the Philistines looked out at a window and saw and behold Isaac was sporting with Rebekah his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold of a surety she's thy wife. And now saidst thou she's my sister. And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, What is this that thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have leaned with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him, and the man waxed great, and went forward, and grew until he became very great. <clears throat> and he had possession of flocks, and possession of herds, and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us. For thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar and did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water's ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from hence and digged another well, and for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. Now we probably covered it several years of time there in that account. Now what we're seeing in the book of Genesis We're being introduced to divine direction and promise. <clears throat> I won't go over all of these things, but this is, a, this is a thorough history of everything up to this point that God is said to have done. As 
something he's caused to happen or said to be done or promised, something of that sort. I broke them out into two lists, things where God is expressly said to have done something, and I'm starting with man, said to do something, and then I, and the things he did after Abraham. I think there's 56, 56 incidents that said God did something. Fifteen of them happened before Abraham in the first 2,000 years of human history. And the rest of them, 41 of them, happened after Abraham. In not quite a hundred, not not quite a little over two hundred years. That ought to tell you. That ought to tell you something, shouldn't it? Two thousand years, fifteen statements of God did, starting with Abraham, up to our text, you have about two hundred and fifty. Not two hundred and fifty. Forty-one instances of him appearing, speaking. Causing, yeah. promising. Mm -hmm. See, God's, God's introducing us to himself. Okay. He's showing us that when it comes to men, mankind, humanity, God's running the show. Yeah. Yeah. And he's teaching us that in this text. Mm -hmm. It's God that causes things to happen. Things that look bad, things that look good. God's behind it. Amen. And I name all those things. I call it sovereign working. Sovereign working. God doesn't have hindrances when it comes to executing his will. Amen. When it comes to experiencing God's goodness, then there's, there's, that's another matter. But when it comes to executing his will... He just does it. It doesn't make any difference who's on the scene. He just does it. That's the way God is. That's the way we're being introduced to it. If someone has an eye for the wife of Abraham or the wife of Rebecca, he just makes it so they don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. He has ways of doing that. Amen. It's clear that the entire record is to, is to this point 26 chapters is an account of the Lord's dealings with men. You take God out of the first 26 chapters and there's no point to even reading them. Yeah, they don't amount to anything. Adam, Eve, Abel, Noah, all of us. They don't want to amount to You take God out of the picture and you wouldn't even know about these people. Yeah. If the theory of evolution was true, which it isn't, we wouldn't know anybody by name or by character or by any any way in ancient history. We wouldn't, we wouldn't know anything about them if evolution was true. But of course it's not true. It's a big fat hoax mm -hmm. yeah. is what it is. And then when you get down to the age of the apostles, they always were talking about what God did. On the day of Pentecost, Peter declared the wonderful works of God. He, he talked about what God did. Peter addressed people in the temple. He talked about what God did. That he talked about the determinate counsel of God. And God raised him up. And he talked about what God did. The prayer of unity, the early, early disciples, they, they prayed back to God what he did. Amen. Paul's exhortation to the synagogue of Antioch, Acts 13, he rehearsed what God did. That's what he rehearsed. Paul's account at Antioch of Pisidia. Stephen's addressed at Sanhedrin. He just rehearsed what God did. He rehearsed the history of the Jews, but he rehearsed what God did. That was his emphasis. Paul's address to the synagogue at Antioch. He did the same thing Stephen did. He went through history, accenting what God did. And because they didn't accept it, God was going to take it from them now. Paul talked to the Athenian philosophers in Acts 17. He talked about what God did. 
God made man, God placed man, but God's going to judge man. See? In the doctrine of Paul, he's always talking about what God did. Now, I'm ashamed to admit this, but during the first 20 or so years of my life, six of, six of which were lived in devotion to God, I didn't think this way. And when I went to the schools of men, they didn't teach me to think this way. They didn't teach me to think of God as the center of the post of the Bible. And I talked to other people who went to Bible College Seminary, and they didn't teach them either. This just simply is not what taught. We'd like to say that there are some people that do teach it, so forth, but the truth of the matter is, we don't know of any that do. It's God-centered. It's all church. The church where I come from, my church background, is church-centered. And then now today, it's, it's man-centered. But that's not how the Bible's written. See, if we fail to see this manner of divine working, that God promises, God causes it, God directs it, God takes people where he wants them to go. God does what he wants to do. If we miss this, we'll miss the significance of Jesus, the seed, the seed of the woman and the seed of Abraham. We'll miss the significance of it. Because if you just stop and think, it won't take you long, less than a minute. Jesus could never have come into this world if it hinged upon human decision. Everybody knows this if they think about it. God could not have promised a virgin would conceive if all he did in his now foreknowledge was see what was going to happen down the road. That being the case, he'd see down the road a virgin was going to conceive. Well, see, that's absurd. <laughs> that's absurd. He's the one that caused it. Amen. So God always saw what he was going to do. And that's how he's presented in Scripture. He's presented in Scripture as seeing what he's going to do. And when he announces to people, he doesn't announce to them what they're going to do. He announces to them what he's going to do. And it may cause them to be this or that, but he that's what he announces. That's what he promises. So you might go to, a, go to a fortune teller or someone that prognosticates the future of mankind. They'll say, well, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And God didn't do that through anybody. Predict storms, predict elections, you know, things like that. God did, that's not the way God talks. And the scriptures are telling us that. <clears throat> now, with that in mind, the first verse says that there was a famine in the land. It's the land of Canaan. There was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abram. So it wasn't the same famine. It's a, it's a different famine. Now, this is the land of promise. This is the land of promise. There's a famine. There's a famine in the land of promise. When some of the people to whom it was promised are in the land. So here's the one to whom the land is promised. They're in the land. There's a famine in the land. See, so some people can't put that together. But this is under divine administration. That's why God announces this. God's as much as saying, look, I'm going to work out my purpose while there's a famine going on. And God is the father of famines. Mm -hmm. On one occasion it says, God called for a famine. Mm -hmm. And a famine came. <laughs> God told Israel they wouldn't hearken to him. Let me read you what he said. This is, this is God said this. Don't think that this could not happen today. This God said, he said, if they, if they didn't obey him, I'll break the pride of your power. I'll make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass and your strength shall be spent in vain for your land shall not yield or increase. Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. I'll make the trees stop yielding. I'll cause your crops not to yield. This is God we're talking about. Thus God introduces himself to us through the prophets a little further. Amos cries out, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city? That a trumpet, trumpet of warning, he's talking about. And the people not be afraid. Shall there be evil or calamity in a city? 
and the Lord hath not done it? Is there really, is there really such a thing as a tornado that God didn't send? Is there? You say, yes, there is. Well, whose world is this? You may not like that when he sent it or where he sent it, but these things come from God. A lot of times they're wake-up calls. Why, it was just a few weeks after the wake-up call, a Joplin went to sleep again. When this world is your center and everything about it, you have uh, preachers preaching that this world is, is the center of everything. That's why people have a hard time with this. That's right. It's when you, like you just said, when you see that God is the, he is the point and what he's doing in salvation and what he's preparing for eternity, well, that, that makes it easier to be able to see that God is in charge of all these things. Amen. But when, you're, when your mind is all world-centered around you and the, the things around you, well, this it's is hard to, to see it. Sometimes God does send famines as punishment. Sometimes he sends them as trials. It's kind of like the one we got here. So that teaches us that convenience is not guaranteed. Amen. Does it make it? I know people say, "Well, God can, God can." The question isn't can God. That's the, that's a, not even the question. It's does God? Amen. Will God? Amen. Now, particularly for those in Christ, and this isn't now this. I don't know of any place this is being preached, but I'm sure it is someplace. Here's a word Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. They were suffering, like losing their lives. No man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereto. <laughs> appointed to afflictions? Well, read it in any version you want. That's what it says. God doesn't intend for you to be comfortable in this world. And about the time you think you should, you're off base. This is not our home. God doesn't aim for us to stay here. He's going to burn this place up. And everyone's going to stand before him in judgment. And under that kind of arrangement, it wouldn't be wise for everything just to be rosy all the time. Here's another word. Peter, let's let Peter testify to us. What glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. So you got that ticket for going 75 in the 30 mile zone, but you were real patient about it and took it real nice. And Peter says, so what? It counts zero. If we do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable to God. If you didn't deserve it, that, and you take it patiently, that's what God counts. For even here on two were you called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that he should follow in his steps. So God called you to suffer. Amen. Now, the, he monitors it. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yes, Sister Annie? Um, I was considering Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't seem like he was very comfortable where he was at. Yeah. And he actually was waiting outside the gate to warn people. He didn't seem like he was at home being comfortable with his No, family. it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Let me give you one word, one more word on it. I say I do this because this, this isn't being preached. There's a lot of Christians do not know this stuff is in the Bible. But the God of all grace who has called us unto eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strength, and settle you. That's the divine economy. This is how God works. You, you see it here in Isaac. He's in the land of promise. There's a famine in the land. And it's beside the first famine. So this is a second famine that took place in Canaan after Abraham began sojourning. We've got two famines already in the land of promise. There's some other famines that occurred in Canaan. The promised land. This is a promised land. I emphasize, to emphasize This is the promised land that flowed with milk and honey. Had springs of water and rivers of water. This is the promised land we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, there's some famines occurred in it. When Isaac was in the lands of famine, when Jacob was in the land, there was a famine. 
There's a famine during the days of David. There's a famine during the days of Elijah. There's a famine during the days of Elisha. During the reign of Zedekiah, the result was that Jerusalem was besieged. There was a famine. During the time of Jeremiah, there was a famine. During the times of the judges, there was a famine. And in the apostolic age, when the apostles were here, there was a famine in Jerusalem and Judea. That's all a promised land. It's a promised land. Now there's a... It's another kind of famine that comes from God. That God sins. And it's the, it's the most serious type of famine. You perhaps will be able to recognize when I read this. Behold, the day has come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to even to the east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. Now this is the Lord's response to Israel's corruption of the word. But it wasn't the last famine of that sort. In Amos's day, they maintained a shell of religion. They were upbraided because they neglected the poor among them. They neglected their own poor. He tells how they were anxious for the feast days and Sabbath days to get over so they could do what they wanted. Oh, boy, you're getting kind of close to home now. Huh? Now, I won't go into those things. I'm going to deal with this text here. It's obvious from this text that the famine was not as strong in Gerar as it was in Canaan. But it was there. You see, brethren, in our day, there is a famine for hearing the word of God. Every honest Christian knows this is the truth. We teach that everybody to stop this stinking pretending. You wander here and you go there. You go there in hopes and you go someplace else in hopes and you can't find the word of God being preached. Some people get upset about it. Why is it this way? I'm going to tell you tonight why it's this way. God has sent a famine in the land. The church has dawdled around so long, God has said, all right, I'm shutting the spigot off. Yeah. You can go to Bible college. You can go to seminary. You can read books. You can go to the library. And you can't come away nourished. Why? Yeah. Why? Why do young, vigorous men who once gave their heart to the Lord, why are they fainting? Why? There's a famine of the hearing of the word of God in the land. There's no need to try and find reasons for it. We know what the reason for it is. The reason for it is God, God's professed people weren't eating and consuming the word. They weren't drinking the water of life. So he said, that's it. I'm not going to allow, I'm not going to allow it to be within the reach of people. Oh, they can have their Bible. But they won't get anything out of it. I'll shut it off. There was a famine in the land. Okay? We, we, we ought to be able to identify with Isaac here. He said he did, he did find some place to find it, and those who seek the truth earnestly, they'll find some place too. God will, God will show them some place. It'll be off the beaten path. <laughs> it won't be the traditional place. It'll be like the Philistine territory. But they'll find a well and they'll find some refreshment and they'll find some food. Maybe down by a brook with the birds bringing the bread and, bread and meat every day. Or maybe a widow in Zarephath. But they'll find it if they want it. But it won't be in conventional places. <coughs> now the Lord said, uh, Isaac adapted to the circumstance. He knew what to do when there was a famine. He didn't collapse and say, woe is me. Woe is me. We better start eating the kids. That's what they did in Jerusalem. They started eating their children. When God let Nebuchadnezzar and the Rome sack the city, they actually ate their children. That's how bad the famine was. 
But Isaac knew what to do. He went down to the, Philist to the king of the Philistines in Gerar to Abimelech. Now someone has wondered if this is the same Abimelech that uh, Abraham went down to. Well, the truth of the matter is I don't know, but I, I'm going to tell you what I'm inclined to think it isn't. Because the, the experience Abraham had with Abimelech when he told him Sarah was his sister, that was, that was 75 to 80 years before this. So I find it difficult to believe it was the same Abimelech, but if it was, I, I, I would accept that. Things are different, but the, it seems unlikely. Now he journeyed there from the well of Laheroi, which was where Hagar found the water, remember? She named the place. He'd been living there. He went to, over to Gerar, which is in the Philistine country. My interest, you know, the Philistines were never driven out of Palestine. Way back there in Joshua's time, the Philistines weren't driven out. They held their own, kept the territory. And this, it was right on the Mediterranean. See, that's probably why things weren't as bad there, right on the Mediterranean. They probably had a little more irrigation than the other people. So he journeyed there. And he took Rebecca with him, as we'll find out. He adjusted what he was doing. He didn't like experiment and say, wait here. Wait here, Rebecca. I'm going to go out and kind of test the waters and see what's out there. He, he moved out. He knew what to do. He just moved out, did, the, did what, without any hesitation. See, faith can enable you to do this. A famine in the land without any apparent fear or unrest. He just packed up and went, to, went over the Philistia <laughs> within traveling distance. It's obvious he didn't intend to stay in Philistia. He intended to remain an occupant of Canaan. He didn't go back to Ur <laughs> or back to Mesopotamia where Rebekah came from. He, I don't know. He went, it was right close. It was this, Gerar was in the promised land, so he he stayed in the land. He didn't intend to leave it. Now we're in a we're in a similar circumstance, brethren. Mm -hmm. We're required to adapt to the situation with wisdom. Let's see. Does the situation require us to leave the land of promise? Ah, we're not going to we're not going to do that. We're not going to we're not going to get out there beyond the land of promise. We're going to stay in the borders yeah. of the land of promise where we can get some nourishment. We're going to. We may have to relocate a little bit, but we're, that's what we're going to do. If the circumstance appears impossible, believers can choose the one that's least disruptive, but they, they bank on God handling the situation. Yeah. Well, God uh, spoke to Isaac. He appeared to him. Now, this is, uh, this is the fourth specific appearance of Jesus, of God, mentioned in Genesis. We're in chapter 26. This is the fourth where it expressly says he appeared. The first three appearances were to Abraham. The Lord God appeared to Abram, Genesis 12, 7. The Lord appeared to Abram, Genesis 17, 1. The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, Genesis 18, 1. This is the fourth one. The Lord appeared unto him, Isaac. Four now this is uh, 2,000 years of human history. In 2,000 years of human history, there were four. But well, Jesus had more appearances on that the day he rose from the dead. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to the women. He appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. And he appeared to the disciples. So he had four appearances up there for the day he rose from the dead. He had as many appearances they had the first 2,000 years here. Remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It is written that the Lord, after Lot had departed from Abraham, said to him, but it doesn't say he appeared at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's any doubt about the impact of sin on the human race, it's confirmed by the rarity of these divine appearances. Mm -hmm. This is telling us, boy, sin really ruptured any association man had with God. Yeah. 
Some assume there's some kind of appearance to Adam, although it never says, it never does say God appeared to Adam. Never does say it. It says he heard God's voice yeah, walking right, in the yeah. garden. Some have assumed that he had access to God. Doesn't say he had access. Yeah. Some say he had fellowship with God and talked with God. Doesn't say that. No, where does the Bible say this? There's nothing in Scripture to indicate that that wasn't the first time, aside from when he gave Adam his wife. We'll count that as the appearance. Mm -hmm. And when he commissioned them, be, plentiful, be fruitful and multiply the earth, mm -hmm. then when he confronted them by their sin. But see, there's no record of them pre-sin, of some kind of pre-sin fellowship with God that Adam enjoyed. There's no record of it. The Lord appeared to him and said, Go not, go not down to Egypt. Now Abraham went down to Egypt. That's all right for him. Yeah. Don't you go down to Egypt. See, what's all right for the person before you may not be all right for you. Don't go down to Egypt. Don't do it. When Abraham encountered a famine in the land, he went down to Egypt and God blessed him and he come out rich out of Egypt. He come out, God prospered him while he was in Egypt. Now, coming from a certain theological background, I find this directive very interesting. Go not down into Egypt. I was taught that much of what we do is established by precedent. That's the official doctrine of the group I was with. That's the official doctrine. If you haven't heard it, you just haven't heard a faithful preacher from that group. That's all. Precedent. Precedent. That is, if it was done by somebody else, it should be done by us. And there's a lot of teaching based, based on precedent. They did it, we got to mm -hmm. do it too. But see, this text contradicts that. Mm -hmm. He was Abraham, the father of the faithful, but he went down to Egypt. And one might tell, that's a precedent, that's where to go now. If there's a famine, that's where to go. But all oh, God says, don't go there. Dwell in the land. What land? The land you're in. From the broad perspective, it was Canaan. The particular part of Canaan he was in was Philistia, the Gerar, where it was. Stay there. See, this is what waiting on the Lord involves, staying where God puts you. You don't go someplace that God didn't put you and wait for him there. You just don't do this. You wait for God where he puts you. That's where you wait or tarry, shall we say. Jesus told his disciples, don't leave Jerusalem. Tarry till you're endured with the power from on high. You stay in Jerusalem. He didn't tell them how long. He said, he said it'd, be, it'd be a short time, but they didn't know how long. You stay where, you stay here. He told Isaac, you stay here, stay in the land. And he spells it out a little further. Sojourn in this land. So you'll have to move about, because he was the nomad, see. He didn't have any property of his own. Mm -hmm. He lived in tents. He was a temporary, he was a sojourner, a pilgrim, mm -hmm. traveling through the land, surveying the land like his father did, not having any certain dwelling place. Sojourn in this land. Don't be wandering over to Assyria. <laughs> Don't be going there. Just walk through this land, this country. As you can see from the map here, Gerar is not far from what would later be Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So it's right kind of in the, on the west side of the land of Canaan. Stay here. The promised blessing was contingent upon Isaac staying there. Amen. It's good to remember the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he has no sorrow. If you're where you're supposed to be and God's made a promise, it's just a matter of time it's going to come. But there are some people, they miss the blessing because they don't stay where God put them. They are these spiritual wanderers. They meander all over the place. And they're never really uh, satisfied. Like Ephesus, they leave their first love. And like Demas, they forsake the work, yeah. having love more the present world. These days, there's not being much said about steadfastness. 
There isn't, is there? Not much being said about steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's for all believers. That's If people don't do this, that's why the blessing of the Lord is not on them. That's why they're not increasing in the Lord and abounding and growing and flourishing, seeing more and seeing further and participating more. That's why. Because they are not staying where God put them. The landowner, he wanted to dig that tree up, mm -hmm. and he told he and the servant asked him, "Let me." It's con talking about being consistent. That's you know, right. And staying with it, he wanted to stay with that that uh, planting one more season. Let's give it one more. That's the, right. The, the consistent nature of the kingdom. I think that there's a there's a lot of people that are in that their life is that period of time. They're getting one last opportunity to wake up. I believe there's some people like that. He said, they don't wake up, that's going to be it. Because God will not always strive with men. Your spirit will not always strive with men. <clears throat> I'm going to give you all these lands. You've got to be willing to wait now, Isaac. I'm going to give them all to you. Now, there's three, several different ways you can look at this. He said, I'll give you all these countries, countries. All right, that emphasizes the inhabitants of the land. There's no such thing as a country that doesn't have any population. The countries, the people live in there. Lands, that'd be the real estate that each group of people mm -hmm. occupied. And he also calls it lands in Genesis 15. Genesis 15, 18, he calls it the land. That's the concentrated, the whole land of Canaan, the borders being specified by God. See, this. These different ways. I'm going to give you all. I'm going to give you all this territory. Is what he said. All this territory. I'm going to give you, and the territory that's occupied by other peoples that are other countries. I'm going to give them to you. And I'll give them to you. Them. Them to you too. Also, and all the land, all the proper, all the real estate. I'm going to give it to you. And just like in one word, grand word, the whole land of Canaan. I'm going to give it to you. And I'll give it to. Uh, your seed after you, too, just like he said to Abraham. He said, I'm not going to perform the oath that I made to Abraham, thy father. I'm going to do it. I told Abraham I was going to do this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, Isaac. You're the next generation. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it not because I promised you. I'm going to do it because I promised Abraham I was going to, I was going to do this. I'll fulfill my oath. God doesn't normally have, God doesn't have to take oaths. Yeah. God doesn't have to swear. Mm -hmm. But he does it because of human frailty and human weakness. To pound into our hearts. I'm going to do what I said. I'm going to do what I said. Yeah. See, a lot of people, when God says, if a person doesn't believe the receive the love of the truth, I'll send him strong delusion. A lot of people don't believe that. They don't believe God do such a thing. God says, uh, you may boldly say, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. God is my helper. He will not forsake me or leave me. Some people don't believe that. But see, God is constantly making his look, my oath. Mm -hmm. I said I was going to do it. Whether I'm going to do it or not is not a question up here. Yeah. Amen. It is a question down there. Yeah. So I have to phrase it in this, mm -hmm. this way. What, there are several fundamental concepts that can be known by this expression. One is that God, prom what God promises, He causes. Mm -hmm. I said He causes yeah, to come to pass. Right. It is that the divine timing is involved mm -hmm. in the fullness of the time, the fullness of the times, when the appointed time had come. See, there's a timing mm -hmm. to God's promises. Yeah. That timing element, that that not that proves that he caused it because he had to set it up. Amen. Mm -hmm. He had to, There's a lot of things behind the scenes that had to happen in order for this That's one right. thing to happen. That's right. So it, God just didn't see it happen. He he caused it. He brought all these threads together to where this came to pass. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I think we'll agree that assurance that God will do what He said is mandatory. You've got to be convinced of this. God 
I'm going to go this far. God will not accept a person that doesn't believe what he said he'd do. Amen. It's mandatory that his promises be believed. Now, how serious is it that people don't know what he's promised? How serious is that? It's serious enough to send a famine of hearing the word of God in the land. And the fulfillment of what God has promised will endure. It goes from generation to generation. Already there's been 2,000 years that people have been resting in the fact that the Lord's going to come again and take us to himself. It's been 2,000 years we've been waiting for this to happen. That's just, that's right. I'm, I'm thankful he had gave us such advance notice. See, some people think of it this way and they say, well, is he really going to come? People have been waiting for him to come and they've been mistaken. He didn't come in their generation. No, I'm just thankful he gave such advance notice yes, that he was coming. Amen. We can conclude from these things that God wants men to know that he's faithful. Nobody's going to serve God who doesn't see this. God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love and work of faith, so if nobody else appreciates what you do for God, so what? Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. God won't forget it. He's Amen. faithful. Yeah. He's called the faithful God. Yeah. Deuteronomy 7, 9. He's called, he has said, he is faithful. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 49, 7. Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 13 says, he abides faithful. Peter said he's a faithful creator, 1 Peter 4.19. So he stresses this yeah. faithfulness. Of course, if there's a generation that's fundamentally ignorant of what God has promised, yeah. knowing that God is faithful is very difficult. It's just you're just philosophizing about yeah. it. If a person doesn't know what the scriptures have said about the faithfulness of God, how what he promised came to pass, but they're not acquainted with that. They're, they're not acquainted with that. They have no alternative but to philosophize about it. And it will not, philosophy will not produce assurance. Amen. It will not produce confidence. <clears throat> well, the effectiveness of faith is uh, yes, marvelous. <laughs> See, neither Abraham nor Isaac inherited the land. Both were promised the land, neither one inherited it. Neither one of them had a plot of land big enough to put the foot on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All their life, they were strangers and pilgrims. Abraham was for a hundred years or so, 105, 105 years, Abraham was a pilgrim in the promised land. Isaac all his life, that's real, Jacob all his life. Not any of the fathers got any of the land, but they lived by faith. When this word came to Jacob, he, to Isaac, he didn't doubt it. He believed and adjusted his life. Said, well, this is my residence right here. Is where I'm staying. Someone may come over and say they discovered gold in Babylonia. Boy, if we go to Babylonia, the gold rushes on there. He said, no, I got to stay. Amen. Well, you got to be able to adapt this, you know. To... Yeah, right. We found a real nice such and such program over here. No, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I got to stay here yeah. where the living waters are. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the record concerned, there's never been a human circumstance that proved too challenging for faith. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, two different views of this circumstance before us. One view is that they inherited the land through their progeny, that Abraham inherited the land through his offspring. All right? there's, there's an element of truth to that. It, it, the all catch is that their offspring never did fill all the land. <laughs> they never. Israel has never occupied the whole promised yeah, land. Right. Solomon and David took taxes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the peripheral nations, yeah. but they didn't, the nations were still out there. Yeah. So this, to this day, they've never occupied yeah. the full land. So I say that, that can't be what it means. Mm -hmm. Another view is, this is what I prefer, is that there's, there's a new heavens and a new earth that's coming. And the new earth is going to be placed in charge of men, redeemed men, glorified men. It's taught in Hebrews, the second chapter. And as a pledge to it, has got the glorified man, Christ Jesus. He's presently in the land, in the world that is to come. He's presently there. He's overall. 
And I conclude, this is an opinion, I conclude that the new earth will be a lot like the old earth. Mm -hmm. Sin won't be in it. Just like the earth after Noah was a lot like <coughs> the earth before Noah. Mm -hmm. And that's when he'll get the land. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. It'll be a central mm -hmm. place there. I imagine the new earth will probably be Larger, you know, but that's, yeah. that's the area. He'll, 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 he's going to get his territory. Mm -hmm. The reason for this unconditional, unconditionality that he said you were going to have the land, it, it, no conditions. Mm -hmm. There were no conditions to this promise. Some promises have conditions. Yeah. If you're faithful, you get a crown of life, you know. So, but some, some promises have no conditions mm -hmm. yeah, right. Amen. because they are tied to God's eternal purpose. The seed of the woman, <laughs> that wasn't connected with anything Eve did or anybody else did. The seed of the woman is going to come regardless what anybody did. It wasn't conditioned about something men did. God raised up a prophet to whom the people would hearken. That wasn't conditioned upon. It's an unconditional promise. A virgin shall conceive. It's an unconditional promise. A forerunner would come and prepare the way for the Lord Jesus as John the Baptist. That was unconditional promise. It wasn't conditioned upon what men did. It was, it, it was only conditioned on what God did. God would raise up a righteous branch, Jeremiah said. It wasn't going to depend on what men did, when they did it, how the society was. That's the nature of these kind of promises. These, these, and these patriarchs seem to sense that. It didn't seem to trouble them that they weren't inheriting the land while they were here. Mm -hmm. Instead, they looked for a city that had foundations yeah. whose builder and maker was God. Amen. They looked for a better country that is a heaven. It didn't seem to bother them mm -hmm. that they didn't get it here. But see, there's all kinds of Christians that bothers them because they don't have a lot here now. Yeah. It's a bad, bad token. Again, this is where the lay out for yourselves <laughs> treasure in heaven place. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. And the record of these things are in order so we might know God better. God is faithful. That's one thing to say that, but he wants you to know that. God's able to do what he has promised. God is fundamentally good. There's no impossibilities with God. God has power over nature. He has power over the devil. He's got power over time. God manages his purpose, and God is kindly disposed of those that trust him. See, this is the way God is. Some people are convinced of it, and some aren't. But the ones that are convinced are a happy people. Yep. Now, I want to give you this land because Abraham obeyed my voice. It's an earthly... Because Abraham obeyed my voice. Because... Elsewhere, God affirms to Ezekiel, you'll know that I have done nothing without cause. All that I have, about all that I have done, I have, there's a cause. There's a cause that moved me to do it. Yeah. Here the cause, Abraham. Abraham obeyed my voice. That's why I'm doing this for you. Yeah. For example, God raised up Pharaoh for a cause. Uh -huh. yeah. Making for himself a great name. There was a cause why God gave men over to be governed by vile lusts. They changed the glory of God, refused to retain God in their knowledge, and for that cause he turned them over to vile lusts, and that's when sodomy broke out according to Romans 1. God sends strong delusion so people will be damned that believe not the truth. That's the because they didn't receive the love of the truth. Because is a cause, see, behind all of these things. There's a cause for Jesus being the mediator of the new covenant. Because this is the only way that makes it functional. There's a cause because our conscience must be purged from dead works. That's why Jesus is reigning. That's the cause behind it. Amen. Now the lexical meaning of the Hebrew word cause is consequence or reward or as a consequence of. The English meaning of the word because is for this reason. The word is a conjunction. Conjunction joins two things together. 
Here it joins the commitment made to Isaac with the commitment made to Abraham. And it's be, it, with Isaac is the because, and Abraham is the cause. Yeah. Amen. One of the early examples of one, blessed, one person being blessed because of another person. Uh -huh. See, culturing people. That's right thinking about this, because this is how he's going to save people. He's going to, in the end, he's going to save people, uh -huh. not because of what they did, but because of someone else did. Amen. You see the, um, the, su the supremacy of God in this and that. Now, he, technically, he doesn't have to answer to anybody. And yet he delights in creating personalities that have the capacity to understand what That's he's right. doing. And then he, he, but he doesn't do it without a cause because everything that he does is reasonable. That's right. It, it all, it's all reasonable, but but see, unless somebody, unless there was, he hadn't created somebody with that capacity, who could understand God? Nobody. And yet we read about personalities in His presence. They have eyes on the front and on the back. They're they're living creatures. Mm -hmm. They have the capacity to be able to see what He's doing when He does it. Yeah. And so, but the, it, it's only because He delights in it. He does everything well. And yet, he does it in such a way that it can be reasoned out and you can come to a conclusion, he's a good God. Yeah, he's amen. good. But if he hadn't done it this way, right. we, we would just say, well, the sun's shining. But we know, we, we know he That's didn't right. allow us to see it. See, God delights amen. in being known. Amen. Most people don't want to be known that way. Uh -huh. <laughs> And people live by themselves off of like hermits because they don't want to be known. They don't want people to you know, mind your own business. People just mind your own business. Don't be prying into mine. But God, God does want you to mind his business. He wants you to probe in and see what he's really like. Yes. God gets great glory from this. Now I do this because Abraham obeyed my voice. Obeyed my voice, my voice. He obeyed my voice. Yeah. Any parent knows that this is a very difficult thing <laughs> for their voice mm -hmm. to be obeyed. But Abraham obeyed the voice of God. The Hebrew word is translated, it's a sound. That's what he's talking about. Just what it, says, it was a sound. He, yeah. he heard something with the hearing of the ear. See, the gospel has been sounded. A lot of people heard it with the hearing of the ear. But it hasn't penetrated. Yeah. Yeah. But Abraham, it penetrated, and he so he did what God said. He heard my he obeyed my voice. The psalmist said, "The voice of God is very powerful." So, if you want to know why Abraham was so successful, it's because he obeyed the voice. Yeah. That is not a voice that echoed. See, some people think God speaks and he echoes them. The third or fourth echo, they'll pick up on it. But no, he, first time God spoke, yeah. Abraham got it. Yeah. And he obeyed the voice of the Lord. When the Lord told him to leave, or he did. Mm -hmm. yeah. He told him to walk through the land, he did. He obeyed my voice. Yeah. He was in the category of people who heard the voice of God and obeyed it without delay or any compunctions or, or reservations. Now God tells Isaac he's being blessed because Abraham did that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, parents, how about thinking about that in your own situation? Mm -hmm. How about thinking about that? Mm -hmm. That maybe your children could be benefited because you obeyed the voice. Yeah. Amen. It's a good thing to think yeah. about, isn't it? Amen. They got enough against them to stack up a few things for them. Be encouraged to do it. And he, Abram kept my charge. One such charge was, walk before me and be thou perfect. That was a charge, see. So Abraham did. Another one, thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thy seed after thee in all our generations. This is my covenant. Every child among you shall be circumcised. He was a charge. He, he, he obeyed it. He kept it. And he kept God's commandments. God commanded Abraham to call Sarah's son Isaac. And as soon as he was born, that's, that's what he did. Amen. He called him Isaac. 
He commanded him to offer up Isaac as a burnt offering, and he set out to do it, and he would have done it if an angel hadn't have stopped him. He, he kept my commandments. And he kept my statutes. That's an appointed custom or manner. See to it that all your offspring circumcised, everybody in your house, all your children, and command your children to walk in my ways. Abraham, Abraham did it. And Abraham kept his laws. Now, wait a minute. As far as the record concerned, there were no moral laws at the time of Abraham. The law didn't come until some time later when uh, it was given to Moses. The law came by Moses. But there's, there's something else said about God's laws. You obeyed my laws. Here's what Paul said. The Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law mm -hmm. written in their hearts. Their conscience is also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing. Mm -hmm. Abraham kept those laws. Mm -hmm. See, there's, there's some kind of intuitive knowledge in man of right and wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now the devil tries to get rid of that, but there is. There's a, it's amazing how detailed it is too. I gather this means that Abraham obeyed all those. It, the inclinations of his heart and what he knew, what God wanted, he just, he just did it. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you for Abraham's sake. So I, Isaac dwelt in Gerar just like God told him to do. The men in that place asked him of his wife. And he said, well, she's, a, she's my sister. <clears throat> for he feared to say, she's my wife, lest they said he... She, the man of the place should kill me for Rebecca because she was fair to look upon. Why not people pretty hard on Isaac because he did that? Mm -hmm. It wasn't that it was right. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand the circumstances, how little was known, the danger of the times. They were living in times when someone wanted your wife, he just come and got her, and that was it. That was the way it was. Mm -hmm. And God hadn't spoken a lot about Husbands and wives. He hadn't. <laughs> he's told us a lot. He hadn't. Yeah. He hadn't told these things. They didn't know. The revelation was short. She's my sister. Same thing Abraham did. Except that was quite a bit earlier. Abraham did that. Abraham did that like before Isaac was born. Isaac was born, right? he was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. He was 60 years old when Jacob and Esau was born. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jacob and Esau are grown men now, so we're talking 75 or 80 years before this event mm -hmm. since the last time Abraham did that. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure that Abraham told Isaac about that event either. So it, may, it doesn't necessarily mean it. Isaac knew this and went out and did it anyway. See, people read this like this happened the next day. Yeah. After Abraham did it. No, it's like, this is it looked about 80 years later. Amen. He faces the same circumstance. I, it's questionable whether he even knew the circumstance that Abraham ever took place. Mm -hmm. But he did this because that apparently is what they did in those days. Uh, the 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 fact that men were known to to kill the husband and take That's the right. wife. That's I right. mean, the fact that both of them did it would leads my, my my understanding is to think that this was a custom. Yeah. And and if he was thinking about the covenant that God just told him about, <laughs> I mean, very well could have been Why, sure could have been doing that. Well, they still did it in David's day. Yeah. That's right. Good night. So. It wasn't they had this broad scope of knowledge about these kind of circumstances. They didn't. So uh, I'm going to be easy with them. Not God didn't condemn him, and so I'm not either. This doesn't sanctify what Isaac did. We understand that. Mm -hmm. But it gives us a reason for us not to be too harsh, yeah. harsh with him. Man, see, it proves to us that man can't direct his own way. <laughs> uh -huh. Now, Scripture tells us this. 
It's not, oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Well, God didn't direct him in this. So it, this, this, just proves, this, just, this just proves the point. It proves the point that man can't take a, make a proper path for himself. God's got to lead him. And man is naturally prone to forget. That's what man did when he forgot God, see. So it's our responsibility, it's not our responsibility to excuse Isaac or sit in judgment upon him. Particularly in view of the fact that God didn't do it, reprimand him either directly or editorially. He didn't say, no, Isaac shouldn't have done this. No such thing. So let's, let's be fair with him. And it says, uh, she, Rebecca, she is fair to look upon. She's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Now at this time, she'd been married to Isaac about 35 to 40 years. She was probably in her 70s at this time. She is beautiful to look upon. Isaac was 40 when they got married. He's 60 when Jacob and Esau was born. That accounts for 30 years, right? And then Jacob and Esau are grown up men, so that gives you an idea how old she was. But she retained her beauty and was perceived as a desirous woman. I don't mean to be crude, but some men never have to face that kind of problem. <laughs> but both Abraham and Isaac did. Remember Solomon said, beauty is vain. Particularly if you're in a bad society. Uh -huh. It really isn't an advantage uh -huh. to be beautiful. I've often thought over the Miss America pageants, you know, it'd be good to hang a big banner over there, all flesh is grass. Now Abimelech, uh, uh, some time passes. Uh -huh. It says it came to pass when he had been there a long time. I don't know how long a long time was, I don't know, but. Abimelech, king of Philistines, looked out the window and saw, behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah. Sporting with Rebekah. Well, with characteristic modesty, the Holy Spirit accounts for this. I'll give you what some of the versions say. Some say he was showing endearment. He was caressing, he was fondling, he was playing with, he was dallying with, laughing with, making love, hugging and kissing, enjoying one another and making fun. I like it just the way, the way it says. Whatever it was, it was something that only married people did. The Bible like saw it, they say, hey, <laughs> I can, this is not what a brother does with his sister. So he called Isaac in and said, why did you, why did you say? Mm -hmm. Now he didn't, Isaac never did say this to Abimelech. He said this to the men of Gerar. Mm -hmm. He said, well, he's straight right up front. He didn't, he didn't try and lie about it. He said, well, because mm -hmm. I was afraid I'd, you'd kill me. Mm -hmm. And there was some kind of rectitude that Abimelech had. I don't, maybe he knew about what had happened to the other Abimelech. I don't know. He said, what is, what is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have L-I-E-N, lean, means it's the old English way of lane. Yeah. Might have lain with thy wife. Oh, that's how, that's how upright the Philistines were. Yeah. Yeah. Someone might just uh, took her and had relations with her. Mm -hmm. That's how upright that nation was. Abimelech knew it. Spirit shows us that there wasn't a sense of this moral rectitude among the Philistines. Abimelech may have had it, but they didn't have it. Why? Why? God's using Abimelech, can't you see? God's using Abimelech to protect Rebecca. And he said, if that would have happened, if these someone had taken her, some words and said raped her, Guilt would have come on the whole nation. Our, all our, all our, 
All our people would have said, well, we know, we know the scripture, we know this did happen. So one person had said a whole bunch of people were cursed. Achan said the whole nation was cursed. Gehazi, Elisha's servant, coveted and took those garments from Naaman and his entire seed, the rest of their lives, were lepers. So there, yes, there's one person sins and a lot of people suffer. And it was that. So Abimelech charged the people. See, God raised him up. This, I, this incident, it was a, as you see, it was a set-up incident yeah. to see to it that Isaac and Rebekah were protected during their stay. Amen. So here Abimelech raised up. He says, whoever touches either one of these is going to die. Yeah. Okay, that, that's, a, that's how God worked it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now this same thing happened where a, a king published an edict that protected the people of God. Mm -hmm. This same thing happened elsewhere. Ahasuerus and the Jews. Remember Esther married him? Yeah. He published an edict after he found out that Haman, what Haman had been up to. Mm -hmm. He said, in every province and every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had a joy and a gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the Jews of the land, many of the people of the land became Jews. <laughs> For the fear of the Jews fell upon them. So here's the Hazarius publishes this edict. Mm -hmm. The Jews are on the favorable side. Yeah. And then Nebuchadnezzar did the same thing. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of that furnace, he made a decree that every people, nation, and language would speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. See? Boy, yeah. oh, what if the president published an edict like that, huh? Yeah. Anybody speaks against the Christians? Or the God and Lord Jesus Christ to the Christian. I can't even imagine it happening, but see, it happened. That's right. Happened back there. And then Darius did the same with, with Daniel. I'm showing you how God raised up a potentate to protect his people. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he's a living God and steadfast forever and so forth. See? So this is a practice God just did it early on with a, mm -hmm. a, the one Abimelech and Abraham and then Abimelech and Isaac, he did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now we, we, we switch from that. He just mentions this mm -hmm. brief incident that would have been something that most people write a book about. This would have at least been a big lengthy chapter in an autobiography. Passes right by it mm -hmm. and says, Isaac sowed in the land. Planted crops in the land. I remember this is a time of famine. The famine ever it was less grievous than here Gerar, but it wasn't like a really good time. He sowed. Maybe he was. Uh, maybe the land was a choice piece of land he was dwelling. You remember what the first of them like said to Abraham? He said, "All behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleases thee." So he might have picked out the best spot, and this is where Isaac went. But anyway, he sowed. We're going to know from what happened that it wasn't a common for everybody else. Same kind of thing happened when Israel went into. Now, now he didn't give him a piece. Abimelech didn't give him a piece of land. He still was. He just loaned it like to him. Same thing happened when Israel went into Egypt. They, the land of Goshen was given to them. Not as they were still belonged to Egypt, mm -hmm. but they gave it to Israel. They turned strangers and pilgrims in it. So Isaac sold it a hundredfold the same year. He got back a hundred times more seed than he put in the ground. Amen. Now the extent of the famine in that area is not known, but this had to be a very extraordinary. Yeah. That's the first crop. First year, hundredfold. The statement accounts for the for this harvest by a, by the statement, and the Lord blessed him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, a, it's how he it's how he accounts. It wasn't. It was an unusually fertile piece of ground, yeah. and they 
fortunately had been able to be watered a lot. And, you know, he had comes over it, and the Lord blessed him. That's why this was this way. And God, like I can command the blessing. Yeah, nothing can stop it when he does. I will command my blessing upon you. In Leviticus 25, 28, 21 says, I will command it. Lord shall command his blessing upon thee in thy storehouses. And all I'll set aside hand to do. I'll make sure plenty's in your cupboard. And I'll make sure everything you do prosper. I'll command that to be done. You say, well, can God still do that? Yes. Amen. Yes, God can still do this. Amen. People have to know it, though. It's good to tell people this. God can do this. So if things are running a little short, God can command the blessing. <laughs> That's why Isaac prospered. God commanded the blessing. And you remember the 133rd Psalm where it says, there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life evermore, where the brethren were dwelling together in unity. Well, the, the situation was so extraordinary that the Philistines envied Isaac. They got kind of jealous, which meant they weren't, uh, they weren't getting these kind of crops. <laughs> but that didn't make any difference. The man waxed great. This is just the beginning. Isaac starts to, he began to prosper, became rich. He grew and went forward, became very, very great, and just kept advancing, getting richer and wealthier. Something God caused, God commanded. See, this was a blessing. In the land of promise, while it was occupied by other people. Oh, this, now listen, brother, the same things happened to a lot of you. You are in the land God's promise. But lo and behold, we found this bit occupied by other people. Yeah. It's a hate trying to drag us down. Yeah. And here we are, we're prospered. Yeah. We're seeing more and more, getting more and more blessed, yeah. and more understanding. Our vision's getting better. We see God clearer. Yeah. Why? What is it? He's making us rich. Amen. Amen. We're growing right under right. the enemy's nose. Yeah. In a famine. <laughs> they can't account for this, see? Just go stick it under their nose. Amen. Let them see someone of the blessing of the Lord's upon them. Yeah. And display your faith yes. to the people. They'll envy you, but that, so be it. So be it. You, can, you can account for that being during a famine, or you can, you can say growing when you're in a foreign nation in Egypt under slavery. That's right. And mm -hmm. the Pharaoh gives a command to throw all the baby boys into the Nile. But they're still growing. Yeah, that's right, still peace. growing. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, yet we might we should say this that in all of the growth that Isaac experienced, all the wealth he experienced, not one minuscule part of it was linked to eternity. Uh -huh. Nothing had to do with heaven, being with the Lord, where you, what happens after you die. Nothing like that. It was all material. And we should add also that it takes a humble person to endure the success and blessing of others. Yeah. Yeah. Now he throws this little tidbit of information in that wasn't in the record of Abraham. He said, for all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines, had stopped them and filled them with earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that was a terrible situation. Abraham dug all these wells over refreshing water coming for their flocks and everything. The Philistines come filled them up with dirt. So their contempt for Isaac and filled them up with dirt. So the wells for all person were reduced to what they were before. And they were on top, there was they had to dig them again. This is no doubt designed by the Philistines to make Isaac leave the area. Yeah. That yeah. <laughs> he didn't leave. So Abimelech comes out, he says, Isaac, go, go, go from us. You're right, you are much mightier than we. <laughs> it's almost exactly what Pharaoh said, wasn't it? He said, they're more than us. They're going to join the enemy and overthrow us. They're a threat. You leave now. You're mightier than us. But uh, Isaac left the area, but he didn't, he didn't leave Canaan. He left just got a where he wouldn't be bothered so much. 
went thence to the valley of Gerar, which is that uh, little spot on that map you see. Now you want to note here the peaceable nature of Isaac. He probably could have engaged in a war and overthrown him in a, in a field battle of some sort. That's probably what Abimelech thought would happen, but he didn't, he didn't do that. He was peaceable. They went someplace else. Now we've got a similar situation on our hands. There's been some wells, some refreshing wells that holy men of God have dug, mm -hmm. namely the apostles, that yielded fresh, life-giving water. Mm -hmm. It sustains a soul. <clears throat> and men have not only refused to drink from these wells, they've clogged them up, yeah. throwed dirt in them. Yeah. Now I picked out a parallel of four things that I feel have been, are like wells clogged up. One is the grace of God. Another is eternal inheritance. Another is justification by faith. Another is the election of grace. And I give you the text for that. These are like wells that holy men, the apostles, they dug. They said something. I give you a text. They said a lot about these wells. They said a lot about these truths, but these things aren't being said today because the wells have been clogged up with institutional mud. Now, during the Reformation movement, which took place in the 16th century, for an extended period, some of these wells were unclogged. They'd been clogged first by institutionalism. Catholicism arose, and it institutionalized religion and clogged up all these wells so people didn't know anything about this at all. And because they, but when they unclogged the wells, because there'd been so much institutional rubble in there, the water wasn't as, as pure as it was in its original state. Then at the rise of, na of rationalism and the exaltation of human understanding with the uh, Enlightenment period, men began to obscure the involvement of God in salvation. All of a sudden they begin to hide that what God does. And they begin to emphasize what man does mm -hmm. instead of what God does. And the wells are clogged up again. Now we're at a junction in time where a few people are unclogging. They found out these wells. They discovered them. They're getting so trying to get the water to flow in good. What? Because we need this. Mm -hmm. People who are nourished by this kind of water become healthy and become powerful and tools in the hands of the Lord. But these things, these truths aren't commonly known, not because they're not in the Bible. God sent a family here in the word of the Lord. See, the people aren't familiar with the Bible. But for those who are earnest enough that want to know about God and Christ and what they've done in salvation, these wells can be unclogged and refreshing water flow from them again. Well, that wasn't enough water. These wells weren't enough water. Sizing servants digged in the valley and found a springing water, and found a well of springing water. Yeah. Now, a well of springing water, mm -hmm. there are rivers that are underneath the surface of the ground. They found it and mapped them out. I've got a map of some of them there. Some of them are oceans, mm -hmm. as big as the as Arct Arctic, mm -hmm. Antarctica. Tremendous bodies of water under the ground. There are rivers. There are rivers. They, they know where the go, water goes in, and when it comes out, it's something like the Mississippi River. It's some tremendous river. Well, wells of springing water are wells that I dig down. They tap into some of these flowing waters, and if they find a way to channel it upward, the water just mm -hmm. springs up as long as there's a river. Just yeah. That's what they discovered, that kind of, that kind of well. You know, you can be a well. Yeah, right. Jesus said, whoever believes on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly yeah. will flow rivers of living water. 
And he said to the woman at the well, the water I give you be a like a well springing up to life eternal. Well, the, uh, the herdman of Gerar said, this is our well. <laughs> this well springing water. They contended for it. They said, this is our well. After all, it's in our country. We want this well. Powers, they contended. So Isaac, being a peaceable man, he removed from thence and digged another well. And if he dug the other well, they, they strove for that one too. So they didn't dig any wells for their own, yeah. of their own. They waited until someone else dug it. There's people like this, you know. So he moved to another place and he he digged another well and they didn't strive. Mm -hmm. And so he said, the Lord's made room for us Amen. in the land. Amen. Now, I know that firsthand that some of you have actually experienced that, mm -hmm. that experience. <laughs> you found this truth. Ooh, boy, you're just rejoicing in it, you know. And people say, that's not true. You just find something else in there. Pretty soon, listen, people that don't know much run out of gas. That's right. Amen. They do. They finally run out of gas. Mm -hmm. Quit striving. Mm -hmm. That was God making room for him, and making room so he wouldn't be having to fight all the time yeah. in the land. Amen. The Lord has made room for us. I'll tell you what he said. We're going to be fruitful in this land. Mm -hmm. We shall be fruitful in the land. Then from there he went up to Bathsheba. That doesn't mean right away. Bathsheba was south, not very far away, but it was the southmost part of Canaan. Dan was the northernmost part. Bathsheba was the southern part, most part. He moved to Bathsheba. Now in Scripture, as we've tried to emphasize to you, it isn't a moment by moment history mm -hmm. all through the all through the record. In scripture he hits the peaks and sometimes the valleys. Some of the valleys would be Adam and Eve's sin. The de details that Cain killed Abel, the world at the flood, and times like this. And always during these when these are mentioned, God did something. Judgment came at that time because of it. But then there, he majors on these mountains mm -hmm. of human history. I named some of them there. This is, this is the kind of text. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. That's like a peak. Mm -hmm. Something's going to start really happening. Happening now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, for myself, to see the way God was managing this whole thing gives a lot of hope. You can look at your life and it can be like a mass of confusion. Mm -hmm. You can imagine what Isaac, how his life would have seemed to him if he looked at, yeah. that, at it that way. Uh -huh. Why did I come here? Got trying to take my wife and now fighting with me about the wells and I can't dig a well without having contention. And he could have had all these kind of thoughts too, yeah. but instead he was cleaving to the promise. Yeah. Amen. Journeying in the promised land is in a strange land. Living by faith. See, they're an example for us. Mm -hmm. This, brethren, is how to live. Amen. Like this. Don't get bogged down in the here and now and what's happening now. Mm -hmm. don't, don't do it. You'll have to deal with it. I understand you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Isaac did have to deal with the threat of his wife being taken. He had to deal with him contending for the wells. Mm -hmm. But he did it in a peaceable manner and moved on. He didn't get bogged down with that. Yeah. And I, I exhort you not to do so either. Amen. Amen. Do your best to learn enough about God that you can see Him working in your life. Amen. Moving you here, getting you away from this influence, bringing you to that influence, Amen. putting you in a place where you have more advantages. God's doing this still. Amen. Same way. I'm going to conclude there. And if you have something you'd like to add tonight... And, uh, you know, some people say, well, wait a minute. The fact that he, he told he told Isaac 
that is because of Abraham would have made Isaac lazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it didn't make him lazy at no. all. He pursued the blessing. He yeah. did what God said. It, it, even though God told him, I'm going to bless yeah. you because of what Abraham did. Yeah. But now when Jacob comes along, see, he's going he, he, he's going to be a part of part of this blessing too, but he's going to get it because Abraham and Isaac. You know, it, it, this whole thing, this being blessed because of somebody else, because yeah. of what somebody else has, has done. As you, you've already said this, but God's school is teaching us how to think about this kind Amen. of stuff. Because people it naturally will say, well, that's not fair. But see, this God is fair. That's right. And he's done it this way because Abraham believed the Lord. And so he accounted unto him for righteousness, and he's going to bless his seed because of him. He told him he was going to do it. Right. Amen. And, of course, it's his blessing, so he can give it to whom he will. I know that everyone has to be cautious about how they explain things. I guess it's not of works. It's not what we have done. What we have done has nothing whatsoever to do with it. Well, that's true of the root of salvation. But one of the churches in Revelation says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, right. I'll keep thee mm -hmm. from this tribulation that's coming on the whole earth. Yep. Because you did this, all that. So a person has to know how to say these things without leaving the impression mm -hmm. that God doesn't pay any attention to what you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. He paid attention to what Abraham did. Yeah. He paid attention to what Isaac did. Yeah. And as Brother Bob said... Isaac knew mm -hmm. that he was being blessed for Abraham's sake, but that provoked him to yeah. be faithful like Abraham yeah. was faithful. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. yeah. Yes, Brother Judah. As I'm thinking about what we've gone through about the faith of Abraham, and now <clears throat> we're going to get into Isaac and later on Jacob, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking that throughout the generations, faith never changes. The characteristics of it, the way it handles the situation, it never changes. It never, it never reverts, so to speak. It's always the same. It looks on the plus side. Of, you can see under, under the surface and see that all things are working together for the good of them that love God. Though on the top, it may look completely different. Yeah. But through the generations, faith never changes. Amen. Brother Tony, you want to say something? Yes, I, you can see by looking at this now, uh, the favor and blessing of God is where he's working. This, mm -hmm. That's the fertile place. Yeah, that's right. And uh, as far as Isaac was concerned now, he made an intention to, to be there, you know, in, in a good standing with God. Because he, he, he intuitively uh, knew that by, by obeying God and being obedient, that he would be blessed. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can be, uh, you can be a pauper. And still be in that fertile place. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. Mr. Barber? I was thinking about this voice of the Lord. How Abraham very quickly recognized it when he spoke to him. Mm -hmm. That there's a sense of which the Lord trains his people to hear, to recognize his voice. Thinking about Jesus and the sheep, the sheep know his voice. But mm -hmm. there's also a sense that there's a part of the person that the Lord chooses that is like God so that when mm -hmm. he speaks they quickly recognize that it's him yeah. Amen. and I was, I was struck by that with Abraham because there wasn't a lot of interaction in the beginning of God but whenever he did hear the Lord he responded immediately yeah. Amen. And, and so I, I want to be able to take advantage more of the nature that God puts within us so that when he speaks then we quickly recognize that it's him, his direction. We understand the things that he's speaking because mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. and then we're able to act and respond quickly and Amen. well. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you don't respond right away, then then Satan will come and put doubt in your mind. That's like right. If you don't, if you don't go ahead and respond, then you, it gives time for mm -hmm. you to think it's yourself and not yeah. the Lord. The I, I like that thing. I really appreciate that these um, servants read down these wells. They, I mean, it, 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 it says that they knew they were there, but it doesn't. It's not a point of, oh, we know they're there. Well, they're plugged up. Let's go somewhere else. 
they knew they were there. They knew that's where there was good water. They knew that's where all the abundance was. So they re it. It was better to re-dig them than to travel elsewhere and further and further away yeah, that's from right. where that source was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You there? Yeah, the, the, the plugging up the wells and the harassment of the herdsmen of the land was all seem to contradict the promise that was given to Abraham to right. give him the land. Mm-hmm. You might think in simplicity that if God's promised us the land, then everyone is going to vacate and everything is just going to kind of fall into place. Uh-huh. But it didn't happen that way. But it didn't uh, didn't cause major complications for, for the fathers. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. They, they believed God and they were they were content. This is one of the peculiarities of faith. It's like a prerogative that only belongs to faith. Amen. That it can it can uh, remain believing God while circumstances appear to contradict. Amen. Amen. Well said. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the record of our Brother Isaac. We can appreciate some of the difficulties that he went through. We see the effectiveness of his faith and your faithfulness in all these things. And we feel, Lord, as as though you have led us in certain ways that have looked on the surface to be inconvenient and difficult. But it is becoming clearer to us that you're working with us for good, acquainting us with yourself, teaching us to just hold a certain disdain for the world, and to anticipate the world to come. We thank you, Lord, for this work. In Jesus' name, amen.